Hello everyone, we are back with a, another, the start of another chapter of Good Omens. And um, like I said, how I'm going to be handling it uh, from this point forward is I'm going to do uh, one half of a chapter uh, in each session. So uh, the next two are going to be uh, chapter three, uh, the first half, and then the second half of chapter three. So um, th these chapters are, uh, are pretty long, like I said, and um, sitting here for longer than an hour is uh, too much for me and it's probably too much for you who are listening to it so <laughs> I'm trying to make it uh, in manageable chunks for both me and you so um, without further ado we're gonna go ahead and hop into our uh, our next chapter here and um, what happened at the end of the last chapter is uh, after Crowley finished um, delivering the Antichrist to uh, who he supposed was the uh, family um, that it was supposed to go to, but as it turns out, there was a bit of a mix-up involving the nuns at the hospital, so, uh, the Antichrist went to the wrong family. Um, so he went to Aziraphale and, um, tried to convince his angelic counterpart that, um, preventing the end of the world was going to be a good thing. Uh, we had some brief glimpses at the, uh, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, um, and then, uh, Aziraphale was convinced so they spent the next 11 years raising the child who they believe is the Antichrist, though they are mistaken. Um, so we are now at uh, 11 years later, and uh, we'll see what happens. Here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 3. Wednesday. It was a hot, fume-filled August day in central London. Warlock's 11th birthday was very well attended. There were twenty small boys and seventeen small girls. There were a lot of men with identical blonde crew cuts, dark blue suits, and shoulder holsters. There was a crew of caterers who had arrived bearing jellies, cakes, and bowls of crisps. The procession of vans was led by a vintage Bentley. The amazing Harvey and Wanda, children's parties a specialty, had both been struck down by an unexpected tummy bug, but by a providential turn of fortune, a replacement had turned up practically out of the blue. A stage magician. Everyone has his little hobby. Despite Crowley's urgent advice, Aziraphale was intending to turn his to good use. Aziraphale was particularly proud of his magical skills. He had attended a class in the 1870s run by John Maskeline, and had spent almost a year practicing sleight of hand, palming coins, and taking rabbits out of hats. He had got, he had felt it would, at the time, quite good at it. The point was that although Aziraphale was capable of doing things that could make the entire magic circle hand in their wands, he never applied what might be called his intrinsic powers to the practice of sleight of hand conjuring, which was a major drawback. He was beginning to wish that he'd continued practicing. Still, he mused, it was like riding a velocipede. You never forgot how. His magician's coat had been a little dusty, but it felt good once it was on. Even his old patter began to come back to him. The children watched him in blank, disdainful incomprehension. Behind the buffet, Crowley, in his white waiter's coat, cringed with contact embarrassment. "'Now then, young masters and mistresses, do you see my battered old top hat? What a shocking bad hat, as you young'uns do say! And see, there's nothing in it! But bless my bridges, who's this rum customer? Why, it's our furry friend, Harry the Rabbit!' "'It was in your pocket,' pointed out Warlock." The other children nodded in agreement. What do you think they were, kids? Aziraphale remembered what Maskeline had told him about dealing with hecklers. Make a joke of it, you pudding heads, and I do mean you, Mr. Fell, the name Aziraphale had adopted at the time. Make them laugh and they'll forgive you anything. Who's oh, so you've rumbled my hat trick, he chuckled. The children stared at him impassively. You're rubbish, said Warlock. I wanted cartoons anyway. He's right, you know, agreed a small girl with a ponytail. You are rubbish. Aziraphale stared desperately at Crowley. As far as he was concerned, young Warlock was obviously infernally tainted, and the sooner the black dog turned up and they could get away from this place, the better. Now, do any of you young'uns have such a thing as a thruppany bit about your persons? No, young master? Then what's this I see behind my ear? I got cartoons in my birthday, announced the little girl. And I got a Transformer, and a My Little Pony, and a Decepticon Attacker, and a Thunder Tank, and a... Crowley groaned. Children's parties were obviously places where any angel with an ounce of common sense should fear to tread. 
Piping infant voices were raised in cynical merriment as Aziraphale dropped three linked metal rings. Crowley looked away, and his gaze fell on a table heaped high with presents. From a tall plastic structure, two beady little eyes stared back at him. Crowley scrutinized them for a glint of red fire. You could never be certain when you were dealing with the bureaucrats of hell. It was always possible that they had sent a gerbil instead of a dog. No, it was a perfectly normal gerbil. It appeared to be living in an exciting construction of cylinders, spheres, and treadmills, such as the Spanish Inquisition would have devised if they'd had access to a plastics molding press. He checked his watch. It had never occurred to Crowley to change its battery, which had rotted away three years previously, but it still kept perfect time. It was two minutes to three. Aziraphale was getting more and more flustered. Do any of the company here assembled possess such a thing about their persons as a pocket handkerchief? No? In Victorian days, it had been unheard of for people not to carry handkerchiefs, and the trick, which involved magically producing a dove who was even now pecking irritably at Aziraphale's wrist, could not proceed without one. The angel tried to attract Crowley's attention, failed, and in desperation pointed to one of the security guards, who shifted uneasily. "'You, my fine Jack Sauce, come here! Now, if you inspect your breast pocket, I think you might find a fine silk handkerchief!' "'No, sir, I'm afraid not, sir.' said the guard, staring straight ahead. Aziraphale winked desperately. No, go on, dear boy. Take a look, please. The guard reached a hand inside his inside pocket, looked surprised, and pulled out a handkerchief, duck egg blue silk with lace edging. Aziraphale almost immediately caught that the lace had been a mistake, as it caught on the guard's holstered gun and sent it spinning across the room to land heavily in a bowl of jelly. The children applauded spasmodically. Hey, not bad, said the ponytailed girl. Warlock had already run across the room and grabbed the gun. Hands up, dog breaths, he shouted gleefully. The security guards were in a quandary. Some of them fumbled for their own weapons. Others started edging their way toward or away from the boy. The other children started complaining that they wanted guns as well, and a few of the more forward ones started trying to tug them from the guards who had been thoughtless enough to take their weapons out. Then someone threw some jelly at Warlock. The boy squeaked and pulled the trigger of the gun. It was a Magnum 32 CIA issue. Gray, mean, heavy, capable of blowing a man away at 30 paces and leaving nothing more than a red mist, a ghastly mess, and a certain amount of paperwork. Aziraphale blinked. A thin stream of water squirted from the nozzle and soaked Crowley, who had been looking out to the window trying to see if there was a huge black dog in the garden. Aziraphale looked embarrassed. Then a cream cake hit him in the face. It was almost five past three. With a gesture, Aziraphale turned the rest of the guns into water pistols as well and walked out. Crowley found him on the pavement outside, trying to extricate a rather squishy dove from the arm of his frock coat. "'It's late,' said Aziraphale. "'I can see that,' says Cro said Crowley. "'Comes of sticking it up your sleeve.' He reached out and pulled a limp bird from Aziraphale's coat and breathed life back into it. The dove cooed appreciatively and flew off, a trifle warily. "'Not the bird,' said the angel. "'The dog. It's late.' Crowley shook his head, thoughtfully. "'We'll see.' He opened the car door, flipped on the radio. "'Hello, Crowley.' "'Hello. Um, who is this?' "'Dagon, Lord of the Flies, Master of Madness, Under Duke of the Seventh Torment. What can I do for you?' "'The Hellhound. I'm just, uh, just checking that it got off okay.' released ten minutes ago. Why? Hasn't it arrived? Is something wrong? Oh, no, no nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Oh, I, I can see it now. Uh, good dog. Nice dog. Everything's terrific. You're doing a great job down there, people. Well, lovely talking to you, Dagon. Catch up sooner. Eh? He flipped off the radio. They stared at each other. There was a loud bang from inside the house and a window shattered. Oh, dear, muttered Aziraphale. Not swearing, with the practiced ease of one who has spent 6,000 years not swearing and who wasn't going to start now. I must have missed one. No dog, said Crowley. No dog, said Aziraphale. The demon sighed. In the car, he said. We've got to talk about this. Oh, and Aziraphale. Yes? Clean off that blasted cream cake before you get in. It was a hot, silent August day far from central London. By the side of the Tadfield Road, the dust weighed down the hogweed. Bees buzzed in the hedges. The air had a leftover and reheated feel. 
There was a sound like a thousand metal voices shouting, Hail! Quite a, cut off quite abruptly. And there was a black dog in the road. It had to be a dog. It was dog-shaped. There are some dogs which, when you meet them, remind you that despite thousands of years of man-made evolution, every dog is still only two meals away from being a wolf. These dogs advance deliberately, purposefully. The wilderness made flesh, their teeth yellow, their breath a stink, while in the distance their owners twitter, He's an old soppy, really? Just poke him if he's a nuisance. And in the green of their eyes, the red campfires of the Pleistocene gleam and flicker. This dog would make even a dog like that slink nonchalantly beneath the sofa and pretend to be extremely preoccupied with its rubber bone. It was already growling, and the growl was a low, rumbling snarl of spring-coiled menace, the sort of growl that starts in the back of one throat and ends up in someone else's. Saliva dripped from its jaws and sizzled out on the tar. It took a few steps forward and sniffed the sullen air. Its ears flicked up. There were voices a long way off. A voice. A boyish voice, but one it had been created to obey. Could not help but obey. When that voice said follow, it would follow. When it said kill, it would kill. His master's voice. It leapt the hedge and padded across the field beyond. A grazing bull eyed it for a moment, weighed its chances, then strolled hurriedly toward the opposite hedge. The voices were coming from a copse of scraggly trees, the black hound slunk closer, jaws streaming. One of the other voices said, He never will. You're always saying he will, and he never does. Catch your dad giving you a pet. An interesting pet, anyway. You'll probably be sticky insects. That's your dad's idea of interesting. The hound gave the canine equivalent of a shrug, but immediately lost interest because now the master, the center of its universe, spoke. It'll be a dog, it said. Huh. You don't know it's going to be a dog. No one said it's going to be a dog. How do you know it's going to be a dog if no one said? Your dad will be complaining about the food it eats the whole time. Privet. This third voice was rather more prim than the first two. The owner of a voice like that would be the sort of person who, before making a plastic model kit, would not only separate and count all the parts before commencing, as per the instructions, but also paint the bits that needed painting first, and leave them to dry properly prior to construction. All that separated this voice from chartered accountancy was a matter of time. They don't eat privet, Wensley. You never saw a dog eating privet. Stick insects do. I mean, they're jolly interesting, actually. They eat each other when they're mating. There was a thoughtful pause. The hound slunk closer and realized that the voices were coming from a hole in the ground. The trees, in fact, concealed an ancient chalk quarry, now half overgrown with thorn trees and vines. Ancient, but clearly not disused. Tracks crisscrossed it. Smooth areas of slope indicated regular use by skateboards and wall of death, or at least wall of seriously grazed knees cyclists. Old bits of dangerously frayed rope hung from some of the more accessible greenery. Here and there, sheets of corrugated iron and old wooden boards were wedged in branches. A burnt-out, rusting Triumph Herald estate was visible, half-submerged in a drift of nettles. In one corner, a tangle of wheels and corroded wire marked the site of the famous lost graveyard where the supermarket trolleys came to die. If you were a child, it was paradise. The local adults called it the pit. The hound peered through a clump of nettles and spotted four figures sitting in the center of the quarry on that indispensable prop to good secret dens everywhere, the common milk crate. They don't! They do! Bet you they don't, said the first speaker. It had a certain timbre to it that identified it as young and female, and it was tinted with horrified fascination. They do, actually. I had six before we went on holiday, and I forgot to change the privet, and when I came back, I had one big fat one. No, that's not stick insects, that's praying mantises. I saw on the television where this big female one ate this other one, and it didn't hardly take any notice. There was another crowded pause. What are they praying about? said his master's voice. Dunno. Praying they don't have to get married, I suspect. The hound managed to get one huge eye against an empty knot hole in the quarry's broken down fence, and squinted downward. Anyway, it's like with bikes, said the first speaker authoritatively. I thought I was gonna get this bike with seven gears and one of them razor blade saddles and purple paint and everything, and they gave me this light blue one. 
with a basket. A girl's bike. Well, you're a girl, said one of the others. That's sexism, that is. Going around giving people girly presents just because they're a girl. I'm going to get a dog, said his master's voice firmly. His master had his back to him. The hound couldn't quite make out his features. Oh, yeah, one of those great big Rottenweilers, yeah? said the girl with withering sarcasm. No, it's going to be the kind of dog you can have fun with, said his master's voice. Not a big dog. The eye in the nettles vanished abruptly downwards. But one of those dogs that's brilliantly intelligent and can go down rabbit holes and has one funny ear that always looks inside out. And a proper mongrel, too. A pedigree mongrel. Unheard by those within, there was a tiny clap of thunder on the lip of the quarry. It might have been caused by the sudden rushing of air into the vacuum caused by a very large dog becoming, for example, a very small dog. The tiny popping noise that followed might have been caused by one ear turning itself inside out. And I'll call him, said his master's voice. I'll call him. Yes, said the girl. What are you going to call it? The hound waited. This was the moment. The naming. It would give it its purpose, its function, its identity. Its eyes glowed a dull red, even though they were a lot closer to the ground, and it dribbled into the nettles. I'll call him Doug, said his master, positively. It saves a lot of trouble, a name like that. The hellhound paused. Deep in its diabolical canine brain, it knew that something was wrong, but it was nothing if not obedient, and its sudden misgiving and its great sudden love of its master overcame all misgivings. Who was it to say what size it should be anyway? It trotted down the slope to meet its destiny. Strange, though. It had always wanted to jump up at people, but now it realized that against all its expectation, it wanted to wag its tail at the same time. You said it was him! moaned Aziraphale, abstractly picking the final lump of cream cake from his lapel. He licked his fingers clean. It was him, said Crowley. I mean, I should know, shouldn't I? Then someone else must be interfering. There isn't anyone else. There's just us, right? Good and evil, one side and the other. He thumped the steering wheel. You'd be amazed at the kind of things they can do to you down there, he said. I imagine they're very similar to the sort of things they can do to one up there said Aziraphale. Come off it, your lot get ineffable mercy, said Crowley sourly. Yes, did you ever visit Gamora? Sure, said the demon. It was this great little tavern where you could get these terrific fermented date palm cocktails with nutmeg and crushed lemongrass. I meant afterwards. Oh. Aziraphale said, Something must have happened in the hospital. It couldn't have, it was full of our people. Whose people? said Aziraphale coldly. My people, corrected Crowley. Well, not my people, you know, Satanists. He tried to say it dismissively. Apart from, of course, the fact that the world was an amazing, interesting place where they both wanted to enjoy as long as possible. There were few things that the two of them agreed on, but they did see eye to eye about some of those people who, for one reason or another, were inclined to worship the Prince of Darkness. Crowley always found them embarrassing. You couldn't actually be rude to them, but you couldn't help feeling about them the same way that, say, a Vietnam veteran would feel about someone who wears combat gear to neighborhood watch meetings. Besides, they were always so depressingly enthusiastic. Take all that stuff with the inverted crosses and pentagrams and cockerels. It mystified most demons. It wasn't the least bit necessary. All you needed to become a Satanist was an effort of will. You could be one all your life without ever knowing what a pentagram was, without ever seeing a dead cockerel other than his chicken marengo. Besides, some of the old-style Satanists tended, in fact, to be quite nice people. They mouthed the words and went through the motions, just like the people they thought of as their opposite numbers, and then went home and lived lives of mild, unassuming mediocrity for the rest of the week with never an unusually evil thought in their heads. And as for the rest of it, there were people who called themselves Satanists who made Crowley squirm. It wasn't just the things they did, it was the way they blamed it all on hell. They'd come up with some stomach-churning idea that no demon could have thought of in a thousand years, some dark and mindless unpleasantness that only a fully functioning human brain could conceive, then shout, the devil made me do it, and get the sympathy of the court when the whole point was that the devil hardly made anyone do anything. He didn't have to. That was what some humans found hard to understand. Hell wasn't a major reservoir of evil any more than heaven, in Crowley's opinion, was a fountain of goodness. They were just sides in the great cosmic chess game. 
where you found the real McCoy, the real grace and the real heart-stopping evil, was right inside the human mind. Huh, said Aziraphale. Satanists. I don't see how they could have messed it up, said Crowley. I mean, two babies. It's not exactly taxing, is it? He stopped. Through the mists of memory, he pictured a small nun who had struck him at the time as being remarkably loose-headed, even for a Satanist. And there had been someone else. Crowley vaguely recalled a pipe and a cardigan with the kind of zigzag pattern that went out of style in 1938. A man with expectant father written all over him. There must have been a third baby. He told Aziraphale. Not a lot to go on, said the angel. We know the child must be alive, said Crowley. So, how do we know? If it had turned up down there again, do you think I'd still be sitting here? Good point. So all we've got to do is find it, said Crowley. Go through the hospital records. The Bentley's engine coughed into life, and the car leapt forward, forcing Aziraphale back into his seat. And then what? he said. And then we find the child. And then what? The angel shut his eyes as the car crabbed around a corner. Don't know. Good grief. I suppose... Get off the road, you clown! Your people wouldn't consider... And the studio you rode in on! Giving me asylum. I was getting to ask you the same thing. Watch out for that pedestrian! It's on the street. It knows the risks it's taking, said Crowley, easing the accelerating car between a parked car and a taxi and leaving a space which would barely have accepted even the best credit card. Watch the road! Watch the road! Where is this hospital anyway? Somewhere south of Oxford. Aziraphale grabbed the dashboard. You can't do 90 miles an hour in central London! Crowley peered at the dial. Why not? He said. You'll get us killed! Aziraphale hesitated. Inconveniently discorporated? He corrected, lamely, relaxing a little. Anyway, you might kill other people. Crowley shrugged. The angel had never really come to terms with the 20th century and didn't realize that it is perfectly possible to do 90 miles an hour down Oxford Street. You just arranged matters so that no one was in the way. And since everyone knew that it was impossible to do 90 miles an hour down Oxford Street, no one noticed. At least cars were better than horses. The internal combustion engine had been a godsend, a blessing, a windfall for Crowley. The only horses he could be seen riding on business in the old days were big black jobs with eyes like flame and hooves that struck sparks. That was de rigueur for a demon. Usually Crowley fell off. He wasn't much good with animals. Somewhere around Chiswick, Aziraphale scrabbled vaguely on the scree of tapes in the glove compartment. "'What's a velvet underground?' he said. "'You wouldn't like it,' said Crowley. "'Oh,' said the angel dismissively. "'Bebop.' "'Do you know, Aziraphale, that probably if a million human beings were asked to describe modern music, they wouldn't use the term bebop?' said Crowley. "'Ah, this is more like it. Tchaikovsky.' said Aziraphale, opening a case and slotting its cassette into the blaupunk. "'You won't enjoy it,' sighed Crowley. "'It's been in the car for more than a fortnight.' A heavy bass beat began to thump th through the Bentley as they sped past Heathrow. Aziraphale's brow furrowed. "'I don't recognize this,' he said. "'What is it?' "'It's Tchaikovsky's Another One Bites the Dust,' said Crowley, closing his eyes as they went through Slough. To while away the time as they crossed the sleeping Chilterns, they also listened to William Byrd's We Are the Champions and Beethoven's I Want to Break Free. Neither were as good as Vaughn Williams' Fat Bottom Girls. It is said that the devil has all the best tunes. This is broadly true, but heaven has the best choreographers. The Oxfordshire Plains stretched out to the west with a scattering of lights to mark the slumbering villages where honest yeomen were settling down to sleep after a hard day's editorial direction, financial consulting, or software engineering. Up here on the hill, a few glowworms were lighting up. The surveyor's theodolite is one of the more direful symbols of the 20th century. Set up anywhere in open countryside, it says there will come road widening, yea, and 2,000 home estates, in keeping with the essential character of the village. Executive developments will be manifest. But not even the most conscientious surveyor surveys at midnight. And yet, here the thing was, tripod legs deep in the turf. Not many theodolites have a hazel twig strapped to the top either, or crystal pendulums hanging from them and Celtic runes carved in the, into the legs. 
The soft breeze flapped the cloak of the slim figure who was adjusting the knobs of the thing. It was quite a heavy cloak, sensibly waterproof, with a warm lining. Most books on witchcraft will tell you that witches work naked. This is because most books on witchcraft are, wit are written by men. The young woman's name was Anathema Device. She was not astonishingly beautiful. All her features, considered individually, were extremely pretty, but the entirety of her face gave the impression that it had been put together hurriedly from stock without reference to any plan. Probably the most suitable word is attractive, although people who knew what it meant and could spell it might add vivacious, although there's something very fifties about vivacious, so perhaps they wouldn't. Young women should not go alone on dark nights, even in Oxfordshire. But any prowling maniac would have had more than his work cut out if he had accosted Anathema Device. She was a witch, after all. And precisely because she was a witch, and therefore sensible, she put little faith in protective amulets and spells. She saved it all for a foot-long bread knife, which she kept in her belt. She sighted through the glass and made another adjustment. She muttered under her breath. Surveyors often muttered under her breath. They mutter things like, Soon have a relief road through here faster than you can say Jack Robinson. Or, that's 3.5 meters, give or take a gnat's whisker. This was an entirely different type kind of muttering. Darksome night and shining moon, muttered Anathema. East by south, by west by southwest, west southwest. Gotcha. She picked up a folded ordnance survey map and held it in the torchlight. Then she produced a transparent ruler and a pencil and carefully drew a line across the map. It intersected another pencil line. She smiled, not because anything was particularly amusing, but because a tricky job had been done well. Then she collapsed the strange theodolite, strapped it in the back of a sit-up-and-beg black bicycle leaning against the hedge, made sure the book was in the basket, and wheeled everything out to the misty lane. It was a very ancient bike, with a frame apparently made of drain pipes. It had been built long before the invention of the three-speed gear, and possibly only just after the invention of the wheel. But it was nearly all downhill to the village. Hair streaming in the wind, cloak ballooning behind her like a sheet anchor, she let the two-wheeled juggernaut accelerate ponderously through the warm air. At least there wasn't any traffic at this time of night. The Bentley's engines went pink-pink as it cooled. Crowley's temper, on the other hand, was heating up. "'You said you saw it signposted,' he said. "'Well, we flashed by so quickly. Anyway, I thought you'd been here before. Eleven years ago!' Crowley hurled the map onto the back seat and started the engine again. "'Perhaps we should ask someone,' said Aziraphale. "'Oh, yes,' said Crowley. "'We'll stop and ask the first person we see walking along a, a track in the middle of the night, shall we?' He jerked the car into gear and roared out into the beach-hung lane. "'There's something odd about the area,' said Aziraphale. "'Can't you feel it?' "'What?' "'Slow down a moment.' The Bentley slowed again. Odd, muttered the angel. I keep getting these flashes of... of... He raised his hands to his temples. What? What? said Crowley. Xerophel stared at him. Love, he said. Someone really loves this place. Pardon? There seems to be a great sense of love. I can't put it any better than that, especially not to you. Do you mean like... Crowley began... There was a whir, a scream, and a clunk. The car stopped. Aziraphale blinked, lowered his hands, and gingerly opened the door. You've hit someone, he said. No, I haven't, said Crowley. Someone's hit me. They got out. Behind the Bentley, a bicycle lay in the road, its front wheel bent into a creditable Mobius shape, its back wheel clicking ominously to a standstill. Let there be light, said Aziraphale. A pale blue glow filled the lane. From the ditch beside them, someone said, "'How the hell did you do that?' The light vanished. "'It do what?' said Aziraphale guiltily. Ugh. Now the voice sounded muzzy. "'I think I hit my head on something.' Crowley glared at a long metallic streak on the Bentley's glossy paintwork and a dimple in the bumper. The dimple popped back into shape. The paint healed. "'Up you get, young lady,' said the angel, hauling anathema out of the bracken. No bones broken. It was a statement, not a hope. There had been a minor fracture, but Aziraphale couldn't resist an opportunity to do good. He didn't have any lights, she began. Nor did you, said Crowley guiltily. 
That's fair. Doing a spot of astronomy, were we? Said Aziraphale, setting the bike upright. Various things clattered out of its front basket. He pointed to the battered theodolite. No, said Anathema. I mean, yes. And look what you've done to poor old Phaeton. I'm sorry, said Aziraphale. My bicycle, it's all bent to... Amazingly resilient, these old machines, said the angel, handing it to her. The front wheel gleamed in the moonlight as perfectly round as one of the circles of hell. She stared at it. Well, since that's all sorted out, said Crowley, perhaps it'd be best if we all just got on our, uh... You, you wouldn't happen to know the way to Lower Tadfield, would you? Anathema was still staring at her bicycle. She was almost certain that it hadn't had a little saddlebag with a puncture repair kit when she set out. It's just down the hill, she said. This is my bike, isn't it? Oh, certainly, said Aziraphale, wondering if he'd overdone things. Only I'm sure Phaeton never had a pump. The angel looked guilty again. But there's a place for one, he said helplessly. Two little hooks. Just down the hill, you said, said Crowley, nudging the angel. I think perhaps I must have knocked my head, said the girl. We'd offer to give you a lift, of course, said Crowley quickly. But there's nowhere for the bike. Except the luggage rack, said Aziraphale. The Bentley has it. Oh. Ugh. The angel scrambled the spilled contents of the bike's basket into the back seat and helped the stunned girl in after them. One does not, he said to Crowley, pass by on the other side. Your one might not. This one does. We have got other things to do, you know. Crowley glared at the new luggage rack. It had tartan straps. The bicycle lifted itself up and tied itself firmly in place. Then Crowley got in. Where do you live, my dear? Aziraphale oozed. My bike didn't have lights, either. Well, it did, but they're the sort you put those double batteries in, and they went moldy, and I took them off, said Anathema. She glared at Crowley. I have a bread knife, you know, she said. Somewhere. Aziraphale looked shocked at the implication. Madam, I assure you... Crowley switched on the lights. He didn't need them to see by, but they made the other humans on the road less nervous. Then he put the car into gear and drove sedately down the hill. The road came out from under the trees, and after a few hundred yards, reached the outskirts of a middle-sized village. It had a familiar feel to it. It had been eleven years, but this place definitely rang a distant bell. Is there a hospital around here? He said. Run by nuns? Anathema shrugged. Don't think so, she said. The only large place is Tadfield Manor. I, I don't know what goes on there. Divine planning, muttered Crowley under his breath. And gears, said Anathema. My bike didn't have gears. I'm sure my bike didn't have gears. Crowley leaned across to the angel. Oh, Lord, heal this bike, he whispered sarcastically. I'm sorry, I just got carried away, hissed Aziraphale. Tartan straps. Tartan is stylish, Crowley growled. On those occasions when the angel managed to get his mind into the 20th century, it always gravitated to 1950. "'You can drop me off here,' said Anathema from the back seat. "'Our pleasure,' beamed the angel. As soon as the car had stopped, he had the back door open and was bowing like an aged retainer, welcoming the young... Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Anathema gathered her things together and stepped out as haughtily as possible. She was quite sure neither of the two men had gone around to the back of the car, but the bike was unstrapped and leaning against the gate. There was definitely something very weird about them, she decided. Aziraphale bowed again. So glad to have been of assistance, he said. Thank you, said Anathema icily. Can we get on, said Crowley. Good night, miss. Get in, angel. Ah, well that explained it. She'd been perfectly safe after all. She watched the car disappear toward the center of the village, and wheeled the bike up the path to the cottage. She hadn't bothered to lock it. She was sure that Agnes would have mentioned it if she was going to be burgled. She was always very good at personal things like that. She'd rented the cottage furnished, which meant that the actual furniture was the special sort you find in these circumstances, and had probably been left out for the dustmen by the local war-on-want shop. It didn't matter. She didn't expect to be here long. If Agnes was right, she wouldn't be anywhere long, nor would anyone else. She spread her maps and things out on the ancient table under the kitchen's solitary light bulb. What had she learned? Nothing much, she decided. Probably it was at the north end of the village, but she'd suspected that anyway. If you got too close, the signal swamped you. 
If you were too far away, you couldn't get an accurate fix. It was infuriating. The answer must be in the book somewhere. The trouble was that in order to understand the predictions, you had to be able to think like a half-crazed, highly intelligent, 17th-century witch with a mind like a crossword puzzle dictionary. Other members of the family had said that Agnes made things obscure to conceal them from the understanding of outsiders. Anathema, who suspected she could occasionally think like Agnes, had privately decided that it was because Agnes was a bloody-minded old bitch with a mean sense of humor. She'd not even... She didn't have the book. Anathema stared in horror at the things on the table. The maps, the homemade divinatory theodoma... Bleh, theodolite. Hard word. The thermos that had contained hot bovril. The torch. The rectangle of empty air where the prophecy should have been. She'd lost it. But that was ridiculous. One of the things Agnes was always very specific about was what happened to the book. She snatched up the torch and ran from the house. A feeling like... Oh, like the opposite of the feeling you're having when you say... Things like, this feels spooky, said Aziraphale. That's what I mean. I never say things like, this feels spooky, said Crowley. I'm all for spooky. A cherished feel, said Aziraphale desperately. Nope, can't sense a thing, said Crowley with forced jolliness. You're just oversensitive. It's my job, said Aziraphale. Angels can't be oversensitive. I expect people round here like living here and you're just picking it up. Never picked up anything like this in London, said Aziraphale. There you are, then. Proves my point, said Crowley. And this is the place. I remember the stone lions on the gateposts. The Bentley's headlights lit up the groves of overgrown rhododendrons that lined the drive. The tires crunched over gravel. It's a bit early in the morning to be calling on nuns, said Aziraphale doubtfully. Nonsense. Nuns are up and about at all hours, said Crowley. It's probably Compline, unless that's a slimming aid. Oh, cheap, very cheap, said the angel. There's really no need for that sort of thing. Don't get defensive. I told you these were some of ours. Black nuns. We needed a hospital close to the airbase, you see. You've lost me there. You don't think American diplomats' wives usually give birth in little religious hospitals in the middle of nowhere, do you? It all had to seem to happen naturally. There's an airbase at Lower Tadfield. She went there for the opening. Things started to happen. Our base hospital not ready. Our man there said there's a place just down the road, and there we were. Rather good organization. Except for one or two minor details, said Aziraphale smugly. But it nearly worked, snapped Crowley, feeling you should stick up for the old firm. You see, evil always contains the seeds of its own destruction, said the angel. It is ultimately negative and therefore encompasses its downfall, even in its moments of apparent triumph. No matter how grandiose, how well planned, how apparently foolproof an evil plan, the inherent sinfulness will, by definition, rebound upon its instigators. No matter how apparently successful it may seem upon the way, at the end it will wreck itself. It will founder upon the rocks of iniquity and sink headfirst to vanish without trace into the seas of oblivion. Crowley considered this. Nah, he said at last. For my money, it was just average incompetence. Hey! He whistled under his breath. The graveled forecourt in front of the manor was crowded with cars, and they weren't nun cars. The Bentley was, if anything, outclassed. A lot of the cars had GT or Turbo in their names, and phone aerials on their roofs. They were all nearly less than a year old. Crowley's hands itched. Aziraphale healed bicycles and broken bones, he longed to steal a few radios, let down some tires, that sort of thing. He resisted it. Well, well, he said. In my day, nuns were packed full to a Morris traveler. That can't be right, said Aziraphale. Perhaps they've gone private, said Crowley. Or you've got the wrong place. It's the right place, I tell you. Come on. They got out of the car. Thirty seconds later, someone shot both of them, with incredible accuracy. If there was one thing that Mary Hodges, formerly loquacious, was good at, it was attempting to obey orders. She liked orders. They made the world a simpler place. What she wasn't good at was change. She'd really liked the chattering order. She'd made friends for the first time. She'd had a room of her own for the first time. Of course, she knew that it was engaged in things which might, from certain viewpoints, be considered bad, but Mary Hodges had seen quite a lot of life in 30 years, and had no illusions about what most of the human race had to do in order to make it from one week to the next. Besides, the food was good, and you got to meet interesting people. 
The order, such as was left of it, had moved after the fire. After all, their sole purpose in existing had been fulfilled. They went their separate ways. She hadn't gone. She'd rather liked the manor, and she said someone ought to stay and see it was properly repaired, because you couldn't trust workmen these days unless you were on top of them the whole time, in a manner of speaking. This meant breaking her vows, but Mother Superior said this was all right, nothing to worry about. Breaking vows was perfectly okay in a black sisterhood, and it would all be the same in a hundred years' time, or rather, eleven years' time. So if it gave her any pleasure, here were the deeds and an address to forward any mail, unless it came in long brown envelopes with windows in the front. Then something very strange had happened to her. Left alone in the rambling building, working from one of the few undamaged rooms, arguing with men with cigarette stubs behind their ears and plaster dust on their trousers, and the kind of pocket calculator that comes up with a different answer if the sums involved are in used notes, she discovered something she never knew existed. She discovered, under layers of silliness and eagerness to please, Mary Hodges. She found it quite easy to interpret builders' estimates and do VAT calculations. She'd got some books from the library and found finance to be both interesting and uncomplicated. She'd stopped reading the kind of women's magazine that talks about romance and knitting, and started reading the kind of women's magazine that talks about orgasms. But apart from making a mental note to have one, if ever the occasion presented itself, she dismissed them as only romance and knitting in a new form. So she'd started reading the kind of magazine that talked about mergers. After much thought, she'd bought a small home computer from an amused and condescending young dealer in Norton. After a crowded weekend, she took it back. Not, as he thought when she walked back into the shop, to have a plug put on it, but because it didn't have a 387 coprocessor. That bit he understood. He was the dealer, after all, and could understand quite long words. But after that, the conversation rapidly went downhill from his point of view. Mary Hodges produced yet more magazines. Most of them had the term PC somewhere in their title, and many of them had articles and reviews that she had circled carefully in red ink. She read about new women. She had never realized that she'd been an old woman, but after some thought, she decided that titles like that were all one with the romance and the knitting and the orgasms, and the really important thing was to just be yourself. Just as hard as you could. She'd always been inclined to dress in black and white. All she needed to do was raise the hemlines, raise the heels, and leave off the wimple. It was while leafing through a magazine one day that she learned that, around the country, there was an apparently insatiable demand for commodious buildings in spacious grounds run by people who understood the needs of the business community. The following day, she went out and ordered some stationery in the name of the Tadfield Manor Conference and Management Training Center, reasoning that by the time she it had been printed, she'd know all that was necessary to know about running such places. The ads went out the following week. It had turned out to be an overwhelming success, because Mary Hodges realized early in her new career as herself that management training didn't have to mean sitting people down in front of unreliable slide projectors. Firms expected far more than that these days. She provided it. Crowley sat down with his back against a statue. Aziraphale had already toppled backward into a rhododendron bush, a dark stain spreading across his coat. Crowley felt dampness suffusing his own shirt. This was ridiculous. The last thing he needed now was to be killed. It would require all sorts of explanations. They didn't just hand out new bodies just like that. They always wanted to know what you'd done with the old one. It was like trying to get a new pen from a bl particularly bloody-minded stationery department. He looked at his hand in disbelief. Demons have to be able to see in the dark, and he could see that his hand was yellow. He was bleeding yellow. Gingerly, he tasted a finger. Then he crawled over to Aziraphale and checked the angel's shirt. If the stain on it was blood, something had gone very wrong with biology. Ooh, that stung, moaned the fallen angel. Got me right under the ribs. Yes, but do you normally bleed blue, said Crowley. Aziraphale's eyes opened. His right hand patted his chest. He sat up. He went through the same crude forensic self-examination as Crowley. Paint, he said. Crowley nodded. What are they playing at? said Aziraphale. I don't know, said Crowley, but I think it's called Silly Buggers. His tone suggested that he could play too, and do it better. It was a game. It was tremendous fun. Nigel Tompkins, assistant head purchasing, squirmed through the undergrowth, his mind aflame with some of the more memorable scenes of some of the better Clint Eastwood movies. And to think he'd believed that management training was going to be too boring. There had been a lecture, but it had been about the paint guns and all the things you should never do with them, 
and Tompkins had looked at the fresh young faces of his rival trainees as, to a man, they resolved to do them all if there was half a chance of getting away with it. If people told you business was a jungle and then put a gun to your head, then it was pretty obvious to Tompkins that they weren't expecting you to simply aim for the shirt. What it was all about was that the corporate head hanging over your fireplace. Anyway, it was rumored that someone over in United Consolidated had done his promotion prospects a considerable amount of good by the anonymous application of a high-speed earful of paint to an immediate superior, causing the latter to complain of little ringing noises in particularly important meetings, and eventually to be replaced on medical grounds. And there were his fellow trainees, fellow sperms to switch metaphors, all struggling forward in the knowledge that there could only ever be one chairman of Industrial Holdings, Holdings PLC, and that the job would probably go to the biggest prick. Of course, some girl with a clipboard from personnel had told them that the courses they were going on were just to establish leadership potential, group cooperation, initiative, and so on. The trainees had tried to avoid one another's faces. It had worked quite well so far. The whitewater canoeing had taken care of Johnstone, punctured eardrum, and the mountain climbing in Wales had done for Whitaker, groin strain. Tompkins thumbed another paint pellet into the gun and muttered business mantras to himself. Do unto others before they do unto you, kill or be killed, either shit or get out of the kitchen, survival of the fittest, make my day. He crawled a little nearer to the figures by the statue. They didn't seem to have noticed him. When the available cover ran out, he took a deep breath and leapt to his feet. Okay, douchebags, grab some sky- Oh no! Where one of the figures had been, there was somewhat something dreadful. He blacked out. Crowley restored himself to his favorite shape. I hate having to do that, he murmured. I'm always afraid I'll forget how to change back, and it can ruin a good suit. I think the maggots were a bit over the top myself, said Aziraphale, but without much rancor. Angels had certain moral standards to maintain, and so, unlike Crowley, he preferred to buy his clothes rather than wish them into being from raw firmament, and the shirt had been quite expensive. I mean, just look at it, he said. I'll never get the stain out. Miracle it away, said Crowley, scanning the undergrowth for any more management trainees. Yes, but I'll always know the stain was there. You know, deep down, I mean, said the angel. He picked up the gun and turned it over in his hands. I've never seen one of these before, he said. There was a pinging noise, and the statue beside them lost an ear. Let's not hang around, said Crowley. He wasn't alone. This is a very odd gun, you know. Very strange. Thought your side disapproved of guns, said Crowley. He took the gun from the angel's plump hand and sighted along the stubby barrel. Current thinking favors them, said Aziraphale. They lend weight to moral argument. In the right hands, of course. Eh? Yeah? Crowley snaked a hand over the metal. Well, that's all right, then. Come on. He dropped the gun into the recumbent form of Tompkins and marched away across the damp lawn. The front door of the manor was unlocked. The pair of them walked through unhe- Excuse me. Unheeded. Some plump young men in army fatigue spattered with paint were drinking cocoa out of mugs in what had once been the sisters' refectory, and one or two of them gave a cheery wave. Something like a hotel reception desk now occupied one end of the hall. It had a quietly competent look. Xerophel gazed at the board on an aluminum easel beside it. In little plastic letters led into the black fabric of the board were the words August 20th to 21st, United Holdings, Holdings, PLC Initiative, Combat Course. Meanwhile, Crowley had picked up a pamphlet from the desk. It showed glossy pictures of the manor, with special references to its jacuzzis and indoor heated swimming pool, and on the back was the sort of map that conference centers always have, which makes use of a careful misscaling to suggest that it is handy for every motorway exit in the nation, while carefully leaving out the labyrinth of country lanes that in fact surrounds it for miles on every side. Wrong place, said Aziraphale. No. Wrong time, then. Yes. Crowley leafed through the booklet in hope of any clue. Perhaps it was too much to hope that the chattering order would still be here. After all, they'd done their bit. He hissed softly. Probably they'd gone to darkest America or somewhere to convert the Christians, but he read on anyway. Sometimes this sort of leaflet had a little historical bit, because the kind of companies that hired places like this for a weekend of interactive personnel analysis or a conference on the strategic marketing dynamic liked to feel that they were strategically interacting in the very building, give or take a couple of complete rebuildings, a civil war, and two major fires, 
that some Elizabethan financier had endowed as a plague hospital. Not that he was actually expecting a sentence like, until eleven years ago, the manor was used as a convent by an order of satanic nuns who weren't in fact all that good at it, really, but you never knew. A plump man wearing desert camouflage and holding a polystyrene cup of coffee wandered up to them. "'Who's winning?' he said chummily. "'Young Evanson of forward planning caught me a right zinger on the elbow, you know.' "'We're all gonna lose,' said Crowley absently. There was a burst of firing from the grounds, not the snap and zing of pellets, but the full-throated crackle of aerodynamically shaped bits of lead traveling in extremely fast. There was an answering stutter. The redundant warriors stared one at another. A further bus burst took out a rather ugly Victorian stained glass window beside the door and stitched a row of holes in the plaster by Crowley's head. Aziraphale grabbed his arm. What the hell is that? he said. Crowley smiled like a snake. And that, I think, is where we're going to leave off for today, because we're about uh, midway through the chapter right now. So um, I will be back tomorrow with the next half, and uh, we'll see what happens next. Until then, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see everyone tomorrow for some more. Bye, everyone. See you then.